All right. First and foremost, I want to give all praises to the Heavenly Father, whose true name in Hebrew is Yahweh, in the name of his only begotten son, who most people call Jesus, but his real name in Hebrew is Yahweh Shai. This is your brother Sa coming back at y'all with another one. Um, you know, I, I don't like to I don't like to wait too long. I like to get right into it. So make sure I like and share the video. Uh, I want to go into this this video that a, a brother, I believe is I believe he's a brother. Um he made and it's entitled uh disproving the hebrew israelites i believe desire what's up my brother para uh sir robert desire shalom family how y'all doing um but i but i saw this video not you know maybe like a few days ago and um and i wanted to give a response to it and one thing that he said in the video is he said watch how if the hebrew israelites even do respond he i guess he doesn't think that we're uh able to respond to some of the claims that he's made and some of the information that he brought out. But he said, watch when they do respond, they're gonna throw ad homs, they're gonna insult me, they're gonna say this, they're gonna say that. Uh, so I wanna take the opportunity, if the brother is gonna respond to this or watch the video, I'm not gonna insult you, my brother. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about, I'm not gonna talk about how you look, I'm not gonna talk about how you sound, I'm not gonna, none of that. I'm just gonna deal with the information directly. So uh make sure y'all please like and share the video and uh you know i got some good stuff i want to go into today man i got some historical records i want to go into you already know we're going to go into the bible but i said it on um you know one of deacon's varsity classes let me just pull up the scripture right quick let me pull up the scripture right quick um this is something that we all have to remember that we are called to do right so let me do this this is first peter 3 and 15. let me zoom in a little bit so 1 Peter 3 and 15 says to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We're called to do this. We believe in what we believe in because we know it to be the truth. We're going to get met with opposition. That's natural. Anything that people believe in, especially like a religion, a so-called religion, uh, we understand this is just our nationality and this is just, you know, the customs that our ancestors are following that were given to them by the Heavenly Father. But anything in life is going to be met with opposition and you have to be prepared to deal with it tactfully. You have to be able to deal with it in meekness. Um, let me get I think this is Titus th one or Titus three. Yeah, Titus three. Uh, if the brother's watching, I know he don't believe in the New Testament. Right. But I just want to establish this just, you know, um, at, on the intro, Titus three and two. I'm going to start at it says to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient and deceived. At one point in time, we were all not in the truth. We were all in a lie, whether it be you was in the Christian church, you was a Muslim, you were gang banging, you were anything what you were doing. At one point in time, you were not in the truth. And so seeing how that's the case, we have to be able to when brothers or heathens, whoever, when they come to us with opposition, but especially a brother or a sister, when they come to us with sincere questions or a point, we have to do like Christ did. You know, sometimes you got to cut, but sometimes there's a time where you have to just answer the question. It's a fair question and it deserves an answer. So um, once we get about 100 people in here, then I'll then I'll go. I'm, I'm going to start the video. But um you know, let me get one more matter of fact. <clears throat> Was it defend the faith? No, that's Jude 1, I think. Ten for the faith. Yep. Here we go. Jude 1 and 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. That's what we need to do. Earnestly contend for the faith. When things get thrown your way, you have to be able to give an answer. All right. So I just wanted to, and like Stro Boogie put in another beautiful scripture. Uh, this is Colossians 4 and 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. That's the one right there. You got to make sure that it's there's some salt in what you're saying. You know, you can't just go out and say certain things. You got to study to show yourself approved and then, you know, present the information. So without any further ado, let's get into the video. So here's the video. All right. Um, I don't know what the brother's name is, but um, this is the video is called Disproving Hebrew Israelites. Fair use, fair use. These are my thoughts and commentary on the subject matter. So let's just skip the intro 
and let's just get right into the meat and potatoes of it. Let me know. Put a one in the chat if the audio and visual is looking good. Let me know how we sound and how we looking. I know how I'm looking. I'm looking. No, I'm playing. But uh, now nah, let me know if the, is the is the audio and the visual all right, family? Let me know. And then we're going to get this thing on and cracking. Uh, to Zaya, I don't think I will. Maybe. We'll see. Okay, one. All praise to the most high. Fair use, fair use. So let's let's start this thing off. Oops. I got it on uh playback speed. I'll be listening to stuff in double speed sometimes. All right. All right. I'm going to go over my personal reasons on why I rejected the Hebrew Israelite movement. Okay. Um so as I've stated before, while I was in college, um I essentially studied various religions, okay? I minored in theology, actually. So I noticed a pattern. And if you're brave enough to go on that journey and start talking to different religions, you'll notice the pattern almost inst instantly as well, okay? Um, every religion on the planet basically states that God showed this one person a vision, right? Showed them a vision, talk to them, or perform miracles through them. That one person then through charisma convinces a group of individuals to follow them, right? Now, again, everybody, like I said in the beginning, we're not here to give any ad hominems towards this brother, all right? So I see some of y'all in the chat saying some of the things that y'all saying. Um, I may not, I may agree with you, right? Hey, I, I might agree with you, but we're here to deal with the information. We're, just remember what he says and then ask yourself because here's what we got to do, right? Um, there are questions that he may present in this video. And I'm not saying you, you know, got to apologize or anything that y'all may not be able to answer. So while you're throwing these insults towards him, just, just remember that if he was there, he may as whatever you're saying he sounds, you may not be able to answer some of these questions. So let's just deal with specifically the information. All right, let's deal with specifically the information. All right, let's go back. Another thing you'll notice is that every religion's claim are exclusive, okay? That means that if you join our religion, you get the benefits of our religion. If not, then you don't, okay? So basically... When a religion makes this stance, they step onto a credibility trap door. Okay. So you say, tell me something. You're the only one that can tell me how to get to heaven. You're the only one that can give me peace. You're the only one that can give me the truth. Now let's stop here first. So his claim is that you're setting yourself up basically in, I can't remember what type of trap door. I think he said a credibility trap door. When you make the claim, because at every, he said every religion makes the claim that at some point in time, a man received vision from God exclusively and that that's not right. Um, and we're going to examine the scriptures and see if the Torah, now mind you, this is a, uh, a Jewish man, a, a black man who was converted to Judaism. And he said that it's wrong for a religion to make the claim that one man received a vision from God and that you have to essentially come to them for the truth. Now, let's just go to the Bible and see if the Torah, in fact, says something similar, because if the Torah, in fact, says something similar, then he's a hypocrite. So we're going to find out if, in fact, this man is a hypocrite. So let's go to Genesis chapter 15 and look at verse one. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham, or at this time his name was Abram, in a vision. Hmm, interesting. Saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So here we have Abraham, who's called the father of faith, who most religions on the world, well, not most religions, but the most populous religions in the world, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and then all the branches of you know, different religions that stem from them, like Catholicism, Pentecostalism, uh, Mormonism, whatever, that stem from those things, they all go back to Abraham, and they only have credence in their religion if what Abraham received was true, which is a vision. <laughs> so uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all make the claim and all have their inception 
And a man named Abraham having a vision from God. Interesting. Let's keep going to verse 12. It says, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, or at again at this time, Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them for a year. So within one chapter, God has given Abraham two visions. Now, do you guys remember? He said basically that if you don't join, if you guys, if you don't join this religion, then you, you know, essentially you don't get into heaven. You don't get the truth. You don't get peace. Well, let's see what Genesis 12, going back with Abraham, let's see what uh, God told Abraham. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. It says, uh, and I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed in you and Abraham and then in the chosen people of Abraham. So literally what he is saying Literally, what he is saying as, as a inciting as a problem for different religions in the world, the very book that he claims to believe in also cites Abraham receives vision and, it, and he receives vision exclusively at this time. At this point in time, God was dealing with Abraham exclusively and he gave him visions and then said that the world's peace and other people's prosperity is contingent upon them blessing and them adhering to Abraham. And if they do not, they do not get blessed. They get cursed. Now I see somebody in the chat said, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Yes, that's what it says. But it also says, this is, is contingent upon whether or not they bless Abraham. So it says again, I will bless them because verse two does say, or sorry, verse three says at the end, all families of the earth shall be blessed. But that's contingent upon whether or not they bless or curse Abraham, right? And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Now what he's dealing with uh, IOCK in the chat is a completely different, subject uh and i've invited him on several occasions to have a dialogue on it but he is rejected i don't really like do he just make all kind of videos and never pops out so um if y'all see him doing anything too much just put him in timeout so again though the point is the the claims that this man has made and cited as an issue with the bible the bible itself makes so that doesn't make very much sense and then he cited that oh it's a problem if you say that that man that received vision was dealt with, dealt with exclusively. Well, let's go to what the Bible says. Look at this. Second Ezra 3, and let's start at verse 13. It says, Now when they lived so wickedly before thee, thou did choose thee a man from among them, whose name was Abraham. He's talking about out of all humanity. Who did he choose? A singular man from among them, whose name was Abraham whom thou loved and unto him only unto him only you showed your will so again let's go back to the to the statement that this man just made let's go back to the statement that this man just made and let's analyze it with that in mind let's go back onto a credibility trap door you get the benefits of our religion if not then you don't okay so basically, when a religion makes this stance, they step onto a credibility trap door. Okay. So you say, tell me something. You're the only one that can tell me how to get to heaven. You're the only one that can give me peace. You're the only one that can give me the truth. You're the only one that can, you know, take me to paradise. Whatever the case may be, whatever the benefits of joining that religion is, you're the only one that has it. That means that the technology that you're offering me must not be patently obvious. It must not be written in the heavens because if everybody could see it, then everybody would be your religion. Well, then I guess then that disproves Judaism and every other religion on the planet Earth because not everybody is Jewish. Not everybody is Christian. Not everybody is Muslim. That doesn't make any sense. Now, let's deal with specifically Judaism, though. Right now, of course, I'm using the word Judaism because uh, that is a religion that is now practiced in the Earth. Now, of course, us as Hebrew Israelites have a, a different uh, understanding of that. Right now, he said, and it's just weird for a Bible believer 
to make statements like this. You're saying that if I don't follow your religion, I can't get peace and prosperity and paradise and things of that nature. The Bible literally, like literally, you guys, it literally says. So let's get some more verses on that. Let's go to Isaiah 43. Let's see what God says. Isaiah 43 and 11. I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me, there is no Savior. Beside God, there is no Savior. Without the Heavenly Father, there is no saving. Without the Heavenly Father, there is no peace. There is no prosperity. There's none of that in the eyes of the Lord. Um, and what does God say about the gods, the other gods? What does God say about the other gods? Psalm chapter 96, verse 5. Look what God says. Let's we'll start with verse 4. For the Lord, Yahweh, or as they call him, Yahweh, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. They're just idols. They're fake. They're not real. That's what the God of the Bible said. So for this man to make the statement as if it's weird and preposterous for a religion to make the statement that, you know, there's one way. And if you don't go that way, then you can't get to paradise or you can't get to heaven. I mean, that's what the God of the Bible says. That's what he himself said. What's another one? What is it? Second Chronicles, I think, 15 or 13. Let's see. Second Chronicles 15 and 12. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul, that whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. Our ancestors entered into a covenant with God. The, the Jews in the Bible entered into a covenant with God to not just follow any other path and any other way to get what they wanted. It's that if they did not seek the Lord God of their ancestors, they would actually be put to death. So I don't know what this guy's talking about. Let's keep going, though. So if it's not patently obvious, then where did you get this information? As a matter of fact, I got one more. Let me just read this one. I think it's Jeremiah 10. Let me just read it real quick. Jeremiah chapter 10, and I'll start at verse 8. It's the, I'm going to read it in, um because I, I read that scripture about idolatry. I don't want to. Bring that up one more time. And then we're going to get into some um, some more information. All right. Jeremiah 10. I want to read it in another version. This is Jeremiah 10. Let's start at verse 8. People who worship idols are stupid and foolish. And God said, God said, every God outside of me is basically an idol. And he said, all the people who worship these idols are stupid and foolish. The things they worship are made of wood. They bring beaten sheets of silver from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz. They give these materials to skillful craftsmen who make their idols, basically make their gods. Then they dress these gods in royal blue and purple robes made by expert tailors. But the Lord is the only true God. He's the only true God. He's the only way to get to peace. He's the only way to get to this paradise that this man is speaking of. He is the only true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. Right. Just wanted to establish that just a little bit more. But let's get back to um, some of his argumentation. When you ask that question. And mind you, let me just say that. I know I keep stopping. He believes in the Tanakh. So he should believe in these very things that I'm speaking of. So it's weird that he's contradicting it. Let's keep going. Jimmy. They typically go into something which I have dubbed the revelation narrative. Right. The story of how that religion came to possess its secrets. OK, they go back to the original story, the founding of that religion. OK, now in the case of the Hebrew Israelite movements, it was started by two gentlemen. OK, one being Frank Cherry and another one being William Crowdy. That's an outright lie. That's just not true. Now, some of the earliest that our people here in the Western Hemisphere, um, so-called black people identified as Israelites, uh, would be uh, Matthews and F.S. Cherry. That's some of the is, uh, earliest people that we see saying that. That is, That's a complete fabrication, though, to now draw a parallel between that's when Hebrew Israelites started. That's not That makes no sense whatsoever. We are saying that we are Hebrew Israelites, that we are Hebrews and that we descend from Israel. So our inception would not start 
in the western in the western hemisphere it would start in the eastern hemisphere what you would what a better video would would be illustrating how we do not descend from the israelites you saying well our inception starts with two people named uh matthews and fs cherry that does not that has no relevance to hebrew israelites and whether our claims are valid or not because we do not need fs cherry or mr matthews to validate our claims as us being Israelites. And of all my years of being as an, uh, identifying as an Israelite, you know how many times I have gone to the writings and the work of F.S. Cherry or Rabbi, quote unquote, Matthews? I'll let you all in the chat. I'm pretty sure you guys know the answer because the answer is probably the same for you all as well. Never. Never have. Now, are they brothers that you can cite as sources that... Uh, of brothers that came to the same conclusion that we are Israelites, sure. But I've never, and I've never seen an Israelite even go to their writings as evidence of us being there. You don't need us. You don't need them to validate that we are the Israelites. So that's just an outright lie. And then he said, you know, the religions go to the revelation story. So does the Bible. <laughs> so does the Bible. The Bible does too. The Bible literally says, let's, matter of fact, let's go to it. Watch this. Let's go to the Bible real quick. Let's see what it says. Let's see when 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 our children, the Israelites' children, ask them about well, what do these what do these verses mean? Well, let's see what our what we're supposed to say. Deuteronomy six and verse. Let's start at verse uh, twenty. Watch this. And when your son asks you in time to come, saying. What mean these testimonies and these statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? When your son says, hey, dad, what do these mean? All these laws that we follow. Then you shall say unto thy son, we were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And he showed signs and wonders great and sore. <laughs> so part of that is the visions and the wonders that the Heavenly Father did for us. So again, he's complete. He's double talking. He's a hypocrite. The brother is. So on one hand, he's saying, look, religions, this is how you know that they're wrong and they're a cult. When you ask them these various questions, they're going to cite that they had revelation from God. The Bible makes the same exact uh, uh, assertion. So now is the, is the Bible fake? That's, this, that's an inaccurate way of going about trying to establish whether or not uh, a so-called religion or ideology is false. The proper way of going about it is, well, you know what? Let's find out because their claim, this is the, the claim that we are making is that we are the Israelites. What you would be it would behoove you to do is to go about proving how we are not the Israelites. Prove we're the dang Canaanites or the, Amor the Amorites or the Hivites or somebody else. The Ethiopian, prove we're Cushites. What you are doing is double talking and putting your own foot in your mouth. That's what you're doing. Now, he's, this man is not a Christian. This man is a Tanakh following. Uh, he's, he's a man who was converted to Judaism, I believe. Let's keep going, though. Okay. It was more Frank Cherry than it was William. All right. William was born into slavery, was treated badly by um, his white slave owner, escaped, joined the Union Army, got out and claimed to have several visions right later in his life. This was at a time where his health was uh, failing and his behavior became strange right um for example he would um sit staring into uh space for long periods of time while people were actually trying to have a conversation with him he would just completely zone out all right just talking bad about a brother now again this is what needs to be understood whether or not frank s cherry or rabbi matthews right whether or not they are true teachers false prophets is irrelevant because that has no basis that, that has that, it's irrelevant because that has no merit in terms of whether or not we are israelites they could be as false as you like to say you're attacking a straw man right now none of that proves that we are not israelite or that yeah exactly that does not prove we're not israelites that does not disprove as like the video is titled that does not disprove hebrew israelites let's keep going though so frank cherry um, stated that he was a self-proclaimed prophet and had visions. In these visions, he stated that God told him that Black people were the original Jews, okay? Um, the world was square, 
And he also stated that Jesus would come back in the year 2000 to essentially incite a race war in which it would end with um, white people being enslaved um, by black people. Now, if these two gentlemen that have these visions, if their visions were true, then the Hebrew Israelite movement is true. Fair? And if these two individuals made it up, you know, their health was declining, they were a victim of the environment that they were born into um, and whatnot, then essentially it's not true. I'm going to be honest with you guys, and I don't want to be disrespectful to this brother. Uh, there's a euphemism that a lot of us use. The euphemism is, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I know I say that a lot. I'll tell somebody, man, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. That, brothers and sisters right there, the conclusion that he just came to at the end of what he just said, it is the top 50 dumbest things I've ever heard in my entire life. Now, I haven't lived very long. I just turned 25 a few days ago. But that is certainly one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. And I'm not just saying it to be disrespectful. I'm saying it because it is dumb is the opposite of smart. And so it is the opposite of the smartest things I've ever heard. He just said, because two random black people in the history of the United States came to the conclusion that we are the Israelites and that they had false prophecies that now all Hebrew Israelites are now telling a lie. That is the equivalent of me going to Israel right now finding two random Jewish people and then them saying, well, you know what? I believe this and this is going to happen. And then it doesn't happen. And now, well, now I guess I can conclude that all Judaism is false, right? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. How many times have we seen uh, people in the land of Israel identify this rabbi right here? He's the Messiah. And then he dies and doesn't fulfill any of the prophecies that the rabbi would uh, or that the Messiah is supposed to fulfill. Now, one prophecy is that the, the Messiah will die, but there are there is a time period in which he's supposed to die and things that he's supposed to do prior to him dying. There are all that's like me going to a Christian church and one Christian gives a false prophecy or five Christians give a false prophecy and say, Jesus is coming back in 20 years. And then Jesus doesn't come back. Well, I guess Christianity is false. That makes no sense whatsoever. And the fact that you would put this on the internet and introduce this as a valid argument, what you need to do, brother, you said you went to school and you have a minor in theology. Now, this may be, you can take this as disrespect. I don't necessarily mean it in disrespect, but brother, what I would encourage you to do, oh, I'm going to say this and I might, God, I just, you know what? As a comedian, there's certain jokes that I have to say. I don't care if this video gets taken down. Brother, you converted to Judaism. I know you know a good lawyer. God, I had to say it, you guys. I had to. Oh, this video might get taken down, but I had to say it. It was too good. It was too good to not say it. I know you converted to Judaism. I know you know some good lawyers. What you need to go uh, do is go to the institution that gave you that minor in theology and sue them, brother. That's what you need to do. No, I said it. I don't care, man. I don't care if the video get taken down. I get in trouble for it. it it's true, and it, it's too good not to say it. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Put it one in the chat. <laughs> that was too. It was like it was right there. I had to say it. I had to, you know. But no, in all seriousness, uh, I cannot. I can't believe because we live in a crazy world that can give you a minor in theology and you have absolutely no idea how to present a reasonable and logical argument. Again, his stance is that because Frank F. Cherry and Rabbi Matthews gave apparently some false prophecies that, well, since they were liars, I guess all Hebrew Israelites must be liars and they're not in the truth. What? That makes no, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense in the Bible at all. How many false prophets of the nation of Israel were there? Weren't there false prophets of our own people in the Bible? So I guess we're all just false. Pro like, come on, man. This is the dumbest stuff I ever heard. Let's go back to it, though. Let's go ahead. Turns out all of the credibility of the Hebrew Israelite movement rests on one, if not two individuals. Wow. I mean, uh, IOCK Israelite only camp killer said happy 25th birthday Assad. I don't celebrate birthdays, my man. Um, appreciate the. The, the dono, though. Uh, so, again, hear what he just said, more importantly. He said that 
our beliefs hang on two people, Frank Matt, uh, Frank Matt, not Frank Matthews, uh, FS Cherry and uh, Rabbi Matthews. Now, I want to do a, I want to do an in depth, not super in depth, presentation on how that's not true. So when you look at the the, the places where so-called black people in West Africa came from, we came from different tribes, right? Different places, Nigeria, Cameroon, Ghana, um, Sierra Leone. And the most prominent tribes, there's, I guess, 10, but there's three prominent tribes that our people came from. The Igbo being the biggest, the Yoruba being probably the second biggest, and then the Ashanti right afterwards. Now, when you look at, for example, let's take a look at the Ashanti, because his, again, this is responding to the Benin. This is responding to his claim that our beliefs hang on two individuals, Frank Matthews, or F.S. Cherry and Mr. Matthews. So let's just see something real quick. Now, let's go to this right here. Now, a lot of brothers, they, uh, I've, I'm sure have seen this, and they quote this as something that it's not. This is, as you see right here, it took me a while to find this actual description of what it is. This is an Ashanti. This is Ashanti ambassadors crossing the Pra. The Pra is a, is a river in Ghana. And this is during the, let me pull it up. Now, real quick, I want to illustrate something. You can see this Ashanti man right here in the middle, right? He's clearly the leader. He's the, the, the people who are rowing the boat are not the leaders. This man is a leader. Now, some sources say he's a priest. Some sources say he's a king. I'm not here to dispute either or. None of those are relevant for the discussion. Now, if he, in fact, was a priest, I guess it would be a little bit more relevant. But here's why this is important. Now, if you look at his chest, he's wearing a necklace. And on that necklace is a breastplate with 12 stones in three rows. Or sorry, in four rows, three stones per row. So there's 12 stones on this breastplate that this man, that this Ashanti man, remember, he's a, from the Ashanti tribe in Ghana. And this is during 1874. Now, in 1874, what took place? You had something called the Anglo-Ashanti Wars. This is, uh, you can look do your own history on this. This is when the British came and colonized uh, Ghana. And this is in the third, during the time of the third Anglo-Ashanti War in 1873 to 1874, right? That's around the time where this took place. And a lot of things that took place were, um, let's see, there was a military campaign, there was murder, like you see a bush fight right here, us uh, losing to the British. These are things that took place. So I just wanted to give a, a timeline. This is not because I know some brothers go there to see this is a slave being led in a slave. This is after slavery. This is after slavery. Um, the, the slavery ended. The, the, abolition, the abolition of slavery took place in 1865. This is about nine years afterwards. So that is a ambassador. That is a Ashanti ambassador leading the British into uh, into their territory. Now, the reason why I, I, I showed you that image is because, let's go back to it. We also read, or as you see right here in this image, we also see in the Bible, the Levites wore a breastplate with four rows and three stones per row. You read about that in the book of Exodus, I believe, the 28th chapter. Here we go. Exodus 28. And let's just read it in the NLT just because it's a little bit of an easier read. Exodus 28. And let's go to. Here we go. Verse six. The craftsman must make the ephod of finely wo uh, woven linen and skillfully embroider it with gold and with blue, purple and scarlet thread. It will consist of two pieces front and back joined at the shoulders with two shoulder pieces. That's exactly what that brother was wearing in that picture. And then it says that, um, you know, you keep on reading. It says that there will be 12 stones, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's very interesting that one of the priests, uh, or sorry, that the priests in the Bible, they also wore an ephod. They also wore a breastplate with 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. Why were these Ashanti wearing that? Because they are also from the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. They come from the tribe of Levi. Another way we know this is look at the word Ashanti, right? There's a... Let's see. Let's look at this. Joshua 15. When you read it, let's read, jo let's read Joshua 15. Watch this. Let's get some context. So it's the town, the tribal allotment for the tribe of Judah. Joshua 15 and 20. This was the homeland allotted to the clans of the tribe of Judah. 
The towns of Judah situated along the borders of Edom in the extreme south were Kab Kabzil, Eder, Jagur, and then it lists some cities. Then it says these following towns were situated in the western foothills were also given to Judah. Then it lists the cities, right? Then look at this. Um, my bad. Also included, verse 37, were, uh, I'm sorry, verse 36, look what it says. Sharim, Aditham, Gadara, Gadarithim, 14 towns with their surrounding villages. The surrounding villages would be the suburbs, the suburbs where who dwelt, who dwelt in the suburbs. We're going to go back. Watch this. This is in the King James. Look, like, for example, Numbers 35 and 2. Command the children of Israel that they give unto the Levites of the inheritance of their possession cities to dwell in. And ye shall give also unto the Levites suburbs for the cities round about them. So when you go back to Joshua, we can read it in the King James now. What was given to the Levites were the suburbs in each tribe. So let's go back to Joshua 15 and verse, I believe it was 42. Watch this. And we'll start verse 41. And Gadareth, uh, Beth, Beth Dagon, and Naama, Makeda, 16 villages, 16 cities with their villages or suburbs, Libna, Ether, and Ashan. So one of the cities, one of the suburbs that the Levites dwelt in was Ashan. Now you have a tribe in Ghana primarily called the Ashanti tribe that wear a breastplate with four rows on it, just like the Levites in the Bible did. And if you keep doing more research on the Ashanti, they'll let you know that some of their, well, matter of fact, let me just show you. Let's go into some more evidence with the Ashanti. The Ashanti also had something called the golden stool. It says the golden stool is the royal and divine throne of the kings of the Ashanti people and the ultimate symbol of power in Asante, which is, I believe, their so-called their the their religion that they have. Or sorry, it's the uh the empire that they have. It says, uh, according to legend, Okonfo Anokie, high priest and one of the two chief founders of the Asante Confederacy, caused the stool to descend from the sky. This is part of their, their mythos. And land on the lap of the first Asante king, Ose Tutu. Now, let me now look what it says. The golden stool is believed to house, is, is believed to house the spirit of the Asante nation, living, dead, and yet to be unborn. Um, and then you can do your own research on this, this throne. It's the golden stool. And it is a stool where it is put on a blanket. This, and then when they carry it, right? And not anybody can just carry this. It's only specific, specific people are allowed to carry this throne. Now, this things should already be coming to mind. Things should already be coming to mind. And there was a specific incident that took place where, um, watch this. Many wars have broken out over the ownership of the royal throne. In 1896, Asante Prempf I was deported rather than risk losing both the war and the throne. In 1900, Sir Frederick Hodgson, the governor of the Gold Coast, demanded to be allowed to be allowed to sit on the golden stool. This a white man, a white man tried to sit on the golden throne, and ordered that a search for it be conducted. This provoked an armed rebellion known as the War of the Golden Stool. They went to war over this stool. It says, let's keep going, uh, which resulted in the annexation of Ashanti to the British Empire but preserve the sanctity of the golden stool, right? And then it tells you, here's the stool right here. It's a, it's a seat. That's what a stool is, right? And you can continue to do, um, you can continue to do your research, right? I'm going to read this part. Replicas have been produced for the chiefs and their funerals are ceremony blackens with animal blood. The stool is one of the main focal points of the Asante today because it, so, it still shows succession and power. Now, what is, what should this remind you of? Because what is a stool? First, let's get, because it said they have wars over this. Well, you read early in 1 Samuel, we had a war. And what happened in the war? Watch this. 1 Samuel chapter 5, I think it's pretty early on. Here we go. Watch this. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now all uh, now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Aphek. Let's get to the point, right? We start losing, and then what happened? So the people, verse 4, so the people 
sent to Shiloh that they might bring forth thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So then we started shouting. We brought the Ark. But then we ultimately lost this war. And then because we lost this war, it will happen. The Philistines took the Ark. Watch this. Where does it say? Let's get to the point. Um, let's get to the point. Watch this. Uh, watch verse 13. And when he came to Eli, uh, he came low. Eli sat upon his seat by the wayside watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man is, came to the city and told it all, the, uh, the, all the city cried out. Let me get to the point. Uh, uh, they took the ark. You can read this. Boom. Verse 19. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken by the Philistines and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed and uh, pains came upon her. Right. We had a war. And then afterwards, God started smiting. Look, capture the ark provokes God. Basically, God gave the people hemorrhoids <laughs> because they took our because they took the ark. Because not anybody supposed to just touch the ark. None, number one. Number two. Let alone a heathen. Only Levites are allowed to touch the ark, let alone a heathen. You read in the book, I believe Joshua, one of our people uh, tried to touch the ark when it was falling and he died. So that's why it was such a blasphemy when this white man tried to come and sit on, our, on the throne. And what does that throne represent? Because it's called a divine throne. It represents it right here. The mercy seat. The mercy seat is just the lid to the ark of the covenant. And what happens on the mercy seat? Um, matter of fact, let's just read it. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. That's what it's called, the golden stool. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Now, what does this, what does the mercy seat represent? The mercy seat represents somebody. <laughs> here we go. This is so funny. Uh, Congratulations, you have earned this stamp of disapproval for being in violation of Matthew 23 and 8. But be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ and all your brethren. Well, false teacher hunter, if you look at the title, title, I have rabbi in quotations. Rabbi. He's not really a rabbi because Christ is actually our rabbi. So you actually just accuse me of something that you now have to repent from because I'm not referring to him as rabbi. It's rabbi in quotations, right? So you should repent from lying on me. But again, what does the mercy seat on the ark of the covenant represent it represents the throne of the heavenly father that's why on the day of atonement the day of atonement watch this here we go verse 22 i'm gonna start verse 21 place the ark uh in the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant which i will give to you then put the atonement cover on top of the ark the, the, the lid the mercy seat I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover, the lid, the mercy seat, between the golden cherubim that hover over the Ark of the Covenant. From there, I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest will go into the Holy of Holies where. Um, what's up, Dabak? You want you want to join is what you're saying? You said you want uh, you said drop the link. You said you want to join or Alazar wants to join or something. But. Once a week, once a year, the Most High, his presence would be right above the lid uh, of the Ark of the Covenant. That's why it's called the mercy seat. And it represents. No, I'm not interested in debating right now. I'm trying to give a, a lesson. So I'll have I'll open up for debate another time. But uh, it represents the, thr the throne of the Heavenly Father. That's why it's called the mercy seat, the, the seat where God sits. And we again see our people in West Africa, in the Ashanti. They had the golden stool. Right. It was a very holy thing that our people had over there. So we don't need again, like this guy said, we don't need Rabbi Matthews or F.S. Cherry to so-called Rabbi Matthews to validate us being the Israelites. That's an outright lie. We can go into our cultural practices. We can go into I mean, there's a whole lot of things we can go to biblical prophecy uh, and we can see us being the Israelites absent of Mr. Matthews and Mr. Cherry. So let's go back to what he said, because that was just really bad. It's not true. So their health was declining. They were a victim of the environment that they were born into um, and whatnot. Then essentially it's not true. 
It turns out all of the credibility of the Hebrew Israelite movement rests on one, if not two individuals. That's just a blatant lie, as we've already illustrated, and we will continue to illustrate even more emphatically. Frank Cherry and William Crowdy. Okay. Now, again, Crowdy's health was failing and his behavior became strange. So he essentially was saying many things about the visions that he had received. And from Frank, Frank Cherry's point of view, we know that Jesus didn't come back in the year 2000. Um, there was no race war. The earth is not a cube. Um, and therefore, I can conclude honestly, that he was a false prophet. Right? Cool. If you want to conclude that, fine. That sounds, I don't care. That again, though, has absolutely nothing. That has nothing to do with the price of tea in China, right? Nothing. So let's keep going. Right. If the religion's origin is not highly credible, then the religion itself and all that follows cannot be highly credible either. Again, does I want put a one in the chat and don't just put a one if you don't understand. Can, do y'all understand that Mr. Matthews and Mr. Cherry are not the Hebrew Israelites origin? It's not. We're going hundreds of years prior to them two individuals in West Africa. And we are seeing just in just in the Ashanti alone. I didn't even go into the Yoruba and how the word Yoruba goes to the, the Hebrew word Jeroboam because they're the tribe of Ephraim or going to the how most people even agree in uh, even like Dr. Michael Brown would agree. That the Igbo are one of the that they descend from the Israelites. Sixty percent, approximately, of the slaves taken to North America were Igbo. So no, that does not disprove our point at all. That is, it's it's completely irrelevant. It's really a red herring, and I don't know why you. Uh, wow, somebody's talked about Dwight Howard. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> I'm not here to throw any ad hominems, but again, the the fact that he can come with this and think that this is a, a viable point is really laughable. So that is the first reason that I rejected the Hebrew Israelite movement. The founding of it um, had significant uh, credibility issues. Okay. You're going and putting all your eggs in one basket in terms of Frank Cherry and William Crowder. We're going back to the very beginning in the late 19th century. Okay. Of when this movement was founded. Now, uh, I don't know any, again, Hebrew Israelites that I don't know the last time I even talked about Mr. Matthews or Mr. Cherry. Now, this reminds me of something, actually, because we have this guy who is another. Um, this guy is, let me see if there's a, a short that this guy has, because I don't want to get no copyright. We have another so-called rabbi, and he affirms that we are the Israelites. Let me see if there's a clip. Um, is this him? There are some people who think that. Um, I don't know if this is it. Like black people or, or Africans are the real Jews. And we're just these like European Fake Jews, or... fake Jews. That's not it. Anyway, um, mm, let me just try to see if I can find a video on Mr. Uh, Harry Rosenberg. If not, y'all can look it up yourself. Anyway, let's get back to the point. Let me get back to the video before we lose it. By two gentlemen, okay? One being Frank Cherry and another one being William Crowdy, okay? It was more Frank Cherry than it was uh lyle's music i'm gonna be honest with you pimp um i'm not even gonna respond there's too much to talk about he said the hebrew israelites are limited because all they know is the bible <laughs> there's no way a dude a grown black man with puckered lips in his profile picture is ever going to find himself being able to have an honest conversation with me bro you got to really do some soul searching, my brother, and lay off the soy lattes. Maybe do a few push-ups, go outside or something. You need to lay off that. You got too much estrogen, pimp. You got to, you got to, got to, got to, got to, got to find some masculinity, family. All right. 
Let's go. William. All right. William was born into slavery, was treated badly by um, his white slave owner, escaped, joined the Union Army, got out and claimed to have several visions right later in his life. This was at a time where his health was uh, failing and his behavior became strange. Right. Um, for example, he would um, sit. Okay, hold on. We're, we're way past this, I think. People being enslaved. Israelite movement. Is true. Both was failing in his not a cube. The Hebrew Israelite movement, the founding of it. Okay, you're going and putting one. There's just a credibility issue. Okay, you you really have to believe that Frank Cherry had that vision. And again, no, we don't. We just don't. I don't know why he keeps saying we do not need to believe Frank Cherry or Mr. Matthews. He listed off several prophecies that never came to pass. So according to the Torah itself, that is something that the Lord has not spoke. Right. All right. Second reason should be pretty obvious is Jesus. OK, this doesn't need me to go into great detail about, but Jews don't believe in Jesus for obvious reasons. Yet the Hebrew Israelites um, want to use the New Testament as authoritative. OK, Jesus made several prophecies himself, such as um, the, the generation that he was speaking to would not die until they seen Jesus coming down uh, from heaven, the stars falling from the sky, et cetera, et cetera, gave this whole speech about, you know, pretty much doom and gloom, the apocalypse and whatnot. And he stated that um, the generation that he was talking to would not taste death until they see all these things happen. And it doesn't need me, it doesn't take me being a rocket scientist to know that, of course, that never happened. Let's address that. Um, and like the brother said, he's far from a rocket scientist. So um, let's just see what Christ said. This is Luke 21. Ben the King James, right? Let's see what Christ said. And let's get some context. Luke 21 and 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem come past with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. What is the context in which he is speaking of when you see Jerusalem come past with armies? When did this take place? 70 AD under the Roman Empire. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries uh, uh, countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now, what does it mean, all things? Does it mean literally everything or all things in reference to the things that are written about Jerusalem being compassed with armies? The context lets you know that's what it's talking about. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon his people. Daniel speaks about this in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, I believe he speaks about it. Uh, we see in Deuteronomy they speak about it. As they say, they shall uh, fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This took place when the Romans under General Pompey killed our people and Titus Vespasian murdered our people and destroyed the temple and exiled us. Now, right here in the margin, it'll say the return of Christ and part of Luke 21. And I believe Matthew 24 is also the same thing. Part of it is of his return, but part of it has an initial and an immediate context. And the initial and immediate context is the Romans and then destroying Jerusalem. So when you continue on down and he says in verse uh, 32, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. There's a couple of ways of looking at it. One is the initial context and the things that he's speaking of in that initial context is with the Romans and what they're getting ready to do to Jerusalem. Two is the the second way of looking at this is the people that are going to be alive when all the messianic prophecies about the end and the day of judgment, when those things come to pass, that generation will see all those things in that context. So it's, he's not saying that when he's alive, this generation, he's talking about the one present. And even if you wanted to say that some of those things were attached to it, the, some of those things would be the ones that took place in 70 AD. So this does not prove that Jesus is a false prophet. This proves that you and your, well, rather your teacher, English teacher, did not give you a good understanding of how to comprehend and do uh, good research in the English language. So let's go back to what he said. 
let's go to um your forgive and repent the water family you have a and I, I really appreciate y'all all the love that y'all been showing on the channel and i'm not just talking about you know uh you know super chats and things of that nature i i certainly appreciate that but y'all been showing a lot of love um uh, for a channel you know an israelite channel to just be about a month and some change old and i've already got six thousand plus subscribers i really appreciate y'all man liking and sharing the videos i really appreciate it a lot family so all praise to the most so y'all know i love teaching this is my passion so uh you know I, I appreciate the love for sure let me go back to the video though okay jesus did not fulfill the messianic prophecies so he essentially is not the messiah all right so now apparently not only he alleges that jesus was a false prophet but that he is he did not fulfill any messianic prophecies well let's look at a couple of messianic prophecies that jesus had to fulfill Malachi 3 and 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Now, who is the messenger? You read in the next chapter, Malachi 4 and 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to their children, and the heat of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So the messenger, it tells you in the next chapter, is Elijah the prophet. So it says, behold, I will send my messenger, that's Elijah, and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord's, the Adonai, right? Like, for example, when it says, and Sarah called Abraham Lord, that's the Hebrew word there used, Adonai, whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So who is this messenger of the covenant, this Adonai, this Lord that we seek? That is the messenger of the covenant that came to the temple. Who is that? Well, there's only been two temples. Does everybody understand that? There have been two temples. The first one was destroyed by the Babylonians. Malachi is not talking about that. This is not talking about the first one. So we had to be talking about the second one. So during the time of the second temple, who was this messenger that was sent to prepare the way for the Lord, and who was the messenger of the covenant whom you delight? Well, we read about a man in first century Israel by the name of John the Baptist who prepared the way for the Messiah. And the Messiah came into the temple, and he, through his death, was the, uh, was the catalyst for the new covenant. That's We can see that visibly in the first century. Now, what else can we see? Messianic prophecies. Micah 5 and 1 says, Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. When did the siege take place? 70 AD. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. So there was a judge of one of our people that would get beat over the head with an iron rod. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from of everlasting. So we see about a man that would live during around the time of the siege, born in Bethlehem. He would have somebody prepare the way for him, and he would be the messenger of a covenant. And he would die. He would, he would get beat over the head with an iron rod. Who else could that be talking about? So the timeline gets very specific and even more specific in the book of Daniel. I encourage everybody to watch Deacon's breakdown on Daniel chapter 9 because Deacon goes in depth into illustrating how Christ has to be the Messiah, according to Daniel chapter 9. Because Daniel chapter 9 says, 70 weeks, verse 24, are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So when you start at verse 25 about the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, that was given by, I believe, Xerxes, and you can read about that in the book of Ezra, about the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. Some people take this as Cyrus, but Cyrus' command was not to rebuild the city, it was to rebuild the temple. So then when you just go and look at this, it says it'll be 62, uh, it shall be three score in two weeks, 62 weeks, 434 years. Now, let me see if I can find this. Bible timeline. Um. Look at this. Let me see if I can find this. Look at this. 
Let me see if I can find this. Um, Xerxes Tribute, Purim. I believe what I'm looking for, and I certainly could be wrong, but it's around 400 and I think it would be 444, right? I believe this is the one that you read about this in Nehemiah 2 and Nehemiah 3. So the timelines match up per perfectly. It would be 62 weeks. Now, we know that these are not literal weeks, that each week is representative of uh, a year, right? So it's 70 weeks, 490 years. So from the going forth of the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem, which would be from Xerxes to Christ, would be 434 years. So the timeline matches up perfectly. But again, I encourage, that's just a super brief uh, top of my head understanding of that or breakdown of that. Deacon goes far in depth into it. So Christ has to be the Messiah because he would have to be around 430-ish years after the going forth of the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. And then afterwards, matter of fact, you read in Daniel 9. Oops. You read afterwards in Daniel chapter 9. That it says, uh, know therefore, uh, verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. So after, after these three score and two weeks, these 62 weeks, the Messiah is going to die. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So around the time of the Messiah, not too long afterwards, the temple would be destroyed. What man do we read about in history is born in Bethlehem, had somebody prepare the way for him, was a messenger of the covenant, who got beat and killed, and then the temple was destroyed afterwards. And there's only one man. That's the Messiah. That's so-called Jesus Christ. His real name is Yahweh Shai. So this brother has no idea what he's talking about. Let's return to the video. Okay. Even if some say that, well, he'll do it when he comes back, when he, the second coming, you know, he'll perform all the, the prophecies and whatnot. Even if I grant you that premise, that is an admission that he did not do it the first time. I have to stop it there because according to the Bible, we just read in Daniel 9 and Micah 5, excuse me, that the Messiah would die. So he has to, if he's the Messiah, then he has to die according to the Bible. And there are other prophecies about when the Messiah returns that he will save the children of Israel, bring them back to their homelands. And that's proof that we are the Israelites because the people currently inhabiting Israel right now, uh, they were not brought back by the Messiah. They were brought back in the early part of the 20th century under the Balfour Declaration. And they with the United uh, Allied Forces helping establish the state of Israel. That's how they were brought back. But according to the Bible, let's just prove that. According to the Bible, the Messiah would return the Israelites back home. So there are prophecies that Christ has yet to fulfill. Yes, certainly that's true. Because he had to die first. All things are be, to be done decently and in order. So let's see what Micah 2 says. Micah 2, watch this. Verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 13. Micah 2 and 13. Your leader will break out and lead you out of exile. Your leader will break out and lead you out of exile. Not the United Nations. Not the Allied forces, the British and the United States. It says our leader, the leader of Israel will lead us out of exile, out through the gates of the enemy cities, Back to your own lands, your king will lead you. The Lord Himself will guide you. So that's more attestation that they are not the people and that we, in fact, are. Okay, let's go back. Okay, so you know, and then Paul comes on the scene 35 years later, according to the Catholic Church, and starts to essentially relaunch the Jesus movement, claiming that he met Jesus and had. You guessed it, a vision. Everybody's having a vision these days. Anyway, he tried to sell his visions to the Jews, but we, we of course, rejected it. And then, we, then he went to non-Jews that aren't learned in uh, Jewish literature, right? So that is why, essentially, Rabbi Gamliel, who was a, who was a juggernaut at, at that time in terms of uh, rabbis, basically told Jews not to do anything about this this movement um, of Christianity, right? He stated that if it's true, then it'll flourish. If it isn't, then it will essentially die out. Notice that every Jew that followed Jesus, right, 
their grandchildren are lo no longer Jews. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm really surprised that he even uploaded this video. His argumentation is so poor. It's, it's, it's beyond laughable. Laughable doesn't even begin to describe it. So he quoted in Gamaliel when in Acts, he says, if it be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you know, then let it be. It'll grow. And then he says, well, it died. What are you talking about? Christianity is literally the biggest religion in the world. It has almost 3 billion followers. What are you talking about, man? Islam, who attests to a lot of the tenets of Christianity, is the second biggest religion in the world. And then so, so what is this guy talking about? But then he says, look at the apostles like Peter and them. I don't think we got to that part. I want to see what he's. I'm going to let him say that part. Have you noticed that? All right. Every Jew that followed Jesus, all of Jesus disciples were Jews. Notice that all of their grandchildren are no longer Jews. Right. This is what Rabbi Gamaliel essentially um, stated. If. If it's of God, then it will stick around. Uh, let's, the teachings of Christ have certainly stuck around. It is the biggest religion. Again, Christianity, which for the record, of course, we do not agree with Christianity. But the teachings of Christ have more than stuck around. It is the most popular religion in the world. And then a subset of that religion, Islam, is the second biggest religion in the world. Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, because it separates Christianity from Roman uh, Catholics, is like the eighth biggest religion in the world. What the hell is this guy talking about? But not only that, he said, um, well, look at the early followers of Jesus, their kids, they were no longer Jews. I want to address that in a moment. I want him to finish his point. If it's not, then it will essentially die out. Right. And we know that, you know, again, where are Peter's descendants, right? Where are um, Thomas's descendants? Where, where are their grandchildren, right? What the? F what does that have to do with anything? He's just, he, it's literally like he's just talking. Where are Moses' descendants? What does, where does Moses' descendants, number one, where are, show me Moses' descendants over there in Israel right now. Show me the direct great, 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 great grandson of Moses. I dare you. Show me Aaron's great, 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 great. Show me Jeremiah's. Show me Ezekiel's. Show like that. That has not, but again, it doesn't have nothing to do with it. But exactly, Ariella, where's Gamaliel's descendants? Where their descendants are has nothing to do with whether or not the 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 fact if their father's practice was correct, right? It has no relevance whatsoever. I don't even know why he would even bring that up. Um, I want to again. I want to let him finish his point, but that's just so weird to even say that. It doesn't make any sense. They're lost. Those that cling to, to the Torah, their descendants are essentially still Jews, right? So the very fact that the Hebrew Israelites quote from a book that has anonymous authors and Paul who taught against the law is another reason I rejected their teaching. It's important to note that not all Hebrew Israelites, um, you know, teach from the New Testament, but I always found it funny that with those who do, because you are hurting your own narrative, essentially, right? You're trying to convince people that they are the original people and they should follow the law, yet you're quoting from a man that claimed that the law was a curse. Paul never called the law a curse. Now, before we get to Paul, I want to address what he said prior, which was, well, you had Peter and their great grandkids, uh, yeah, exactly, Ariella. Um, but he said Peter and their grandkids, they uh, they didn't follow Christianity. OK, well, I'm going to show you people in the Old Testament whose kids didn't follow the ways of their ancestors, the ways of the Most High. But for example, like even Matthew and Mark, you have early church traditions like um, like um, some of the early church fathers. I can't remember which ones, maybe like Eusebius or Polycarp. And they cite just years not too many years afterwards that, yes, they quote Matthew and they say Matthew wrote this. They say Mark wrote this. When you read the book of John, he says, I am that beloved disciple, which is John. Luke, he tells you that it's, it's I'm writing this. So it's not anonymous authors, number one, like Ariella said in the chat. Number two, uh, just because he made, again, he made the statement that 
a lot of the, the, the Jewish disciples, Jewish disciples that followed the Messiah, that practiced Christianity, uh, they did not follow Christianity. So therefore, they didn't believe in Christ and they went back to Judaism. So therefore, Christianity is wrong. If we're to follow that logic, then guess what? The whole Bible needs to be thrown away. What do I mean? Judges chapter 18 and verse 30. Then they set up the carved image, an idol, and they appointed Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, as their priest. This family continued as priest for the tribe of Dan until exile. So one of Moses' descendants, one of his great, great, great grandchildren, right? One of his uh, descendants was an idolater, <laughs> was an idolatrous priest. So I guess throw Moses away, right? Makes no sense. What about... King David. First Kings chapter 11, verse two. I'm going to start at verse, uh, let me just get to the point, verse four. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods. Wow, Solomon became an idolater who wrote Ecclesiastes. Uh, instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God, as his father David had been. So I guess get rid of Ecclesiastes too then, right? Just get rid of all the works of David himself and even in the book of Psalms because his one of his descendants didn't follow him. Makes no sense whatsoever. What about um, what about Samuel? What about Samuel in the Bible? What about Samuel in the Bible? Uh, and Eli. First Samuel chapter eight. Watch this. We'll go back to the. I'll read it in the NLT. Verse Samuel eight and one. As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. So Samuel's kids were wicked, too. Does that mean get rid of them? I mean, come on, man. This is stupid. Same thing with Eli's kids. And I could keep going on and on and on and how there were righteous men in the Bible who had wicked descendants and didn't follow the ways of their ancestors. That has no merit on whether or not the religion of their ancestors or ways of their ancestors is true and valid. This guy is literally just talking. Let's go back. And the law is no more. It's an end to the law, right? Jesus was an end to the law. Okay, I, I for, almost forgot. So he said Paul taught against the law. Well, let's see what the book of Acts says. Let's see if Paul spoke against the law. Acts 21, and let's start at verse 20. After I'm going to start at uh, I'm gonna start verse 20. One second. It says, after hearing this, they praised God, and they said... You know, dear brother, talking to Paul, how many thousands of Jews, which also I believe, I thought the Jews didn't believe anyway, and they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have been told that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the law of Moses. So there's a rumor that Paul's saying, hey, look, man, we heard that you're telling people not to keep the law of Moses, like this guy's asserting. It says, uh, they've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children, nor to follow their customs. Then they come up with a plan. Here's what we're going to do. Since we've heard about you doing teaching these things, we're going to have you go uh, perform the vow of a Nazarite, pay for these guys to get their heads shaven and give the sacrificing. So that what? Verse 24 at the very end of it. Then everyone will know that the rumors are false and that you yourself observe the Jewish laws. So what is this guy talking about? Let's hear what he said one more time. Claim that the law was a curse and the law is no more. Paul didn't say the law is no more. Paul himself followed the law. And in Romans 3 and 31, he says, do we make void the law? He literally said, do we go no more with the law? God forbid. Hell no. Rather, we establish the law. The hell is this guy talking about? an end to the law right jesus was an end to the law romans 10 and 4 is what he's quoting when paul says for christ is the end of the law for righteousness meaning paul is saying is paul saying that you don't have to keep the law no more no what he's saying is you cannot keep the law by itself and expect to be made righteous in the eyes of god you have to believe in the messiah as well why well one is because he's a part of the law in deuteronomy chapter 18 so he just doesn't understand these verses that's why he's coming to these conclusions let's keep going so I found that interesting. My third reason 
is based on history. Okay, I found that Hebrew Israelites try to rewrite history based on conspiracy theories. They claim that there are 12 tribes of Israel and they have a list of who they are. Okay, salvation apparently comes from your ethnicity. If you are not part of the 12 tribes, then you cannot essentially be saved. So let's unpack this. Okay. So one of the tribes are Haiti, right? They claim that Haiti Haitians are from the tribe of Levi, right? Now, who knows the history of, of Haiti? How did Haiti become Haiti? Right? Slave revolution, right? This island, which is now called Haiti, how did people get there? They brought them from Africa. By who? The French, right? So the French essentially enslaved them and dominated them. You had some intermarrying and mixing of cultures and whatnot. That's why many Haitians can actually speak French, right? They don't speak French. They speak Creole, which is not French. It's similar to French, but no, it's not French. Can a lot of Haitians speak French, though? Yes, they can. But what he's really, like Ariella said, he's literally just talking. But um, he's not hes not referring to Creole. He thinks Creole is French, and it's not. Um, and, of course, then they say that the Mexicans are from the tribe of Issachar, right? Well, how did the Mexicans become to be the Mexicans, right? Let's look at the history of these groups. The Spanish, the conquistadors, Cortez, these people came and colonized Mexico, right? They intermarried, combined cultures with Native American tribes, the Aztecs, Mayans, Incas, etc. Same with the Dominicans. What does this tell us? Why do I bring this up? He's going to explain everybody because, again, that has absolutely no relevance to whether or not we are the Israelites. So I'm so he, now he's saying, OK, why am I bringing this up? He's about to tell us, guys. OK, why am I bringing this up? Because these ethnicities didn't exist prior to the colonization. This is, again, one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my entire life. He's saying prior to the Spanish colonizing Mexico and the French colonizing the part of the island of Hispaniola now referred to as Haiti, that these ethnicities never existed. Well, sir, to be well, one is a national is a nationality, right? Now there are there are some national Haitians who are not ethnically the same people as the most the overwhelming vast majority of the people of that island. But what we are saying is the the so-called black people taken from West Africa, brought to the island of Haiti, those are the tribe of Levi. We're not saying just because you're born in Haiti, that makes you a Haitian or sorry, that makes you a, a Levite. That's not what we're saying. So if you interpreted it as that, that's far from what we're saying. And for you to even insinuate that is really weird to me. Let's keep going. They didn't exist. The people existed. The people that are now referred to as Haitians have always existed. <laughs> They've always been here. Now, at one point, did they call them? Was there a point in time where they didn't call themselves Haitians? Certainly. But that's not relevant. We're talking about the people, the people who are then taken from parts of West Africa, Benin, Togo, Syria alone, et cetera, and brought to the island of Haiti. They, Those are the Levites. They primarily occupy the island of Haiti, but there are other parts of uh, French colonies, St. Lucia, uh, I believe, uh, the, and the Grenadines, different parts. It's very simple. I don't understand why he's making this such a, a hard to grasp concept. The people existed. <laughs> the, the, uh, the name of the island is irrelevant. We're talking about the peoples, the race of people and where they come from. Okay. You didn't have a Haitian. You didn't have a Dominican. You didn't have a Mexican. You didn't have um, a Puerto Rican. You didn't have an African-American back when the Bible was written. Right? What an idiot. Now, I, have, I said I wasn't going to throw any ad hominems, but I'm sorry. That's the one. I'm sorry. That's really dumb, brother. And I hope I don't take you for that. You know, you're you're a college brother. You went to school. That was really foolish, my brother. That was really dumb. There was no African American. There was no Dominican. There, duh. Duh. But if I go up to people and say, like, imagine that how stupid I would look. 
And I would say, hey, you people. Well, I can't say Haitians because the word Haiti didn't exist in the Bible. I just say, hey, you guys. What guys? You guys. Okay. You guys are Levi. They're not going to know that I'm saying that Haitians predominantly make up the tribe of Levi or Levi. <laughs> They're going to be completely confused. Or if I say, hey, you niggas. What niggas? You guys. Well, I can't say African-American because that's not in the Bible. But you guys, you're from the tribe of Yehuda, <laughs> right? Or Yehawada in the uh, ancient Hebrew. You guys are the tribe of Yehuda. You guys are Yahudim. You guys are Jews. They're gonna. They're not going to know if they're... I'm just talking about that particular group or... We're just talking, it, we're using these words, although they're not in the Bible, Haitian, Mexican, because that, those are geographical locations that have groups of people in them that the world is familiar with and people that they are familiar with and people that they are familiar with. So when I say so-called Mexicans are from the tribe of Issachar, I'm not just saying that anybody born in Mexico is of the tribe of Issachar. I'm saying that the indigenous people of that geographical location are of the tribe of Issachar. They're referred to as Mexican now. See how simple that is? I don't understand why this guy's making it so difficult. <laughs> All right, let's go back. Of course, Puerto Rican didn't exist. We're talking about the Tainos. Do you, do you get it, my brother? All right. These ethnicities came about through slavery and colonization. It was a mixture of cultures, essentially. So how could these people be part of the 12 tribe when these people didn't even exist? The ethnicities didn't even exist. These people didn't exist. Do you guys how see? Do you guys understand how dumb of a statement that is? These people didn't exist. Prior to colonization, now they didn't exist as the title of Haitian or the title of Dominican or the title of Puerto Rican, but they existed. <laughs> they existed. Do you guys understand the point? Put a one in the chat if you understand the point. They they existed. They just before the colonizers came. First of all, Haiti does not come from the colonizer. Let me matter of fact, number one, say that IET is not from the colonizer. IET is from the indigenous people of Haiti. That's that's that. So let's get that out the way, right? Um, but again, Mexicans, they existed. They just weren't called Mexicans. They were Aztecs. They were Azteca. People in uh, Puerto Rico, they existed. They just didn't call themselves Puerto Ricans. They were Tainos. So the, these people didn't exist until the, so wow, the white man came over here and just created cultures and just made people up. What are you talking about, man? Let's keep going. Right. They are a combination of cultures, languages, etc. So the Haitians are from the tribe of Levi. Right. So the French and Africans came together and produced an original tribe member. That That's how that works. Can it still be done now? Can someone from Africa get with an individual from France and they come together and um, essentially make a a tribe, a member of a tribe of Levi, right? I don't even understand that. I, I'm trying to, like, I, I sat back and I listened to that like four or five times before I started this. I, I don't understand. Can somebody put in the chat, what is he saying right there? I don't, I do not understand what is he saying. I truly don't. That was in, in, in like, when you, when somebody says something like, I, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then the, the caption, it just says uh, uh, inaudible. <laughs> that, that's what I took that as. Just inaudible, an, an intelligible thought. I didn't even know what the hell he was talking about there. Could someone help me out? What, what was he saying? Like, honestly, what is he talking about with that point right there? Because I'm sure he was making a tremendous point. I just don't know what the hell the point was. Can someone help me out? Yeah, like a brother said, that's like saying burgers never existed because the first time a nigga took a piece of bread and stuck it in between uh, a piece of meat and stuck it in between two pieces of bread, it wasn't called a burger. They didn't call it a burger later. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. That's a perfect example. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> okay, Craig Thomas, explain. I I don't know what he's talking about. I don't. I didn't. I didn't understand at all what he was talking about. Okay, so he's saying based on that mixing. There was not this gigantic level of mixing like people try to make it out, number one. That's why you go to the island of Haiti right now. Now, while there is a diverse color range of what people look like, that has no 
there's no tellings on the the mixing or lack thereof in the island of Haiti. So I don't know if that was his point. I don't know what the hell he's trying to say. Somebody said, crazy. Hassad, you are just as much as a Gentile as a so-called white man, bro. Peace. Carry on. How about this, bro? I'm not talking to you right now, but let's set up a dialogue and see if that's in fact the case. How about that, Darius? Someone get him in touch with the uh, with the email or any social media stuff, and let's see if this dude is man enough to have a conversation. Because I, I promise you, brother, it's a whole lot different when you're in front of 500 something people and you're having a conversation. You put on the spot, but I don't think I think you're scary, and I think even though I'm high, I think even though I'm high yellow, I think you're yellow. But um, it makes no sense. He's saying that he 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 posed the question: Can somebody from Africa come together with somebody in? France and make a tribe. I mean, not make one, just invent it. If that's what he's saying, but can can a brother from the tribe of Levi get with a non-Israelite and then create an Israelite? I mean, we see Moses doing that twice. I don't know what this guy is talking about at all. But let's keep going. Hebrew Israelites claim that white people or Europeans came and robbed them of their identity. They were originally from the 12 tribes, but white people essentially stole their identity, right? Yet in order to get a crucial tribe of Levi, right? In order to get that tribe, you need the French. Let's just look at this for a second. <laughs> ah, look at this, man. This is the look. Someone's like make a meme or something. This is ridiculous, man. What is he talking about? We, we do not need the French, brother. At all. I don't, I don't even know how to res How do we respond to that, Assad? Okay. I think what he's trying to say is that Haitians and the rest of uh, indigenous peoples throughout North, Central, and South America we apparently we white people who are the most infertile people on the planet right now they they had so much intermixing by force i'm not going to say the r word they had so much intermixing by force that we are now they basically effed a whole people out of their ethnicity <laughs> I, I but but that's just not it's just not historically accurate at all I would love for you to produce some sources that show how Europeans were going to all these different parts of North, Central, and South America and just effing these people out of existence. Because that's essentially what he's saying. We needed the French. No, we didn't. Prior to French colonization of West Africa, English colonization of West Africa, what we are saying, and as we've already illustrated, absent of any European influence, cultures, those people in West Africa are the Israelites, were the Israelites, and a lot of them still are to this very day. So I don't know what you're talking about. We don't need the French. Here's what we're saying very simply, right? So we, our ancestors fled from Israel in Northeast Africa in 70 AD, made our ways into certain parts of North Africa and then around the Horn of Africa or the North part of Africa into the interiors of West Africa, right? And certain parts of interiors of Africa and then into West Africa as well, right? Uh, where they're the Israelites. They were taken captive from West Africa into Haiti, into Brazil, into the United States, into Canada. They are still the Israelites. They're still the Israelites. Then they were enslaved by peoples. I don't understand. when They never stopped being the Israelites. I don't know what you're talking about, my brother. All right. Let's uh, keep going now. The same white Europeans that you claim stole your identity is also the same gene that produces the tribe itself, right? Another thing. Okay, so that's what he's saying is that the genes. What evidence do you have to illustrate that Europeans were effing people so much that they when they effed us out of existence? Where is that? I'd love to see that source. I'll, I'll save you some time. It doesn't exist. They are the most infertile, infertile people in the planet. They certainly did not F the Tainos out of existence or the people of Haiti. He's just talking. We don't need the gene. We're not saying the gene of the French 
well, that's what Haiti came from the French and they needed the French to make, that means you need the French to make Haiti, which means that if the Haitians are Levites, you need the French and the French Levites. No, we're saying the indigenous people of Mexico, for example, are the Issacharites. We're saying the people, the slaves that were taken from West Africa brought to what's now known as Haiti are Levites. That's all we're saying. That is interesting to note is that if you go to the average Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, etc., and ask them about being part of the 12 tribes, they will tell you they have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Another non point. He said, if you go up to the average Dominican, the average Mexican, the average Puerto Rican, they're going to have no idea about them being an Israelite. You go up to a lot of, watch this. If you go up to some so-called black people in America, they don't know that we got over here by slave ships. Does that mean the transatlantic slave trade never happened? If you go up to certain Mexicans, they may not know about them being from the uh, Aztecs. Does that mean that the Aztecs never existed or that they're not Aztecan? If you go up to, like, do you, see, do you see where I'm going with this? That's the stupidest point I've ever heard. But number one, it's not true. Let's just see something real quick. All right, let's, let's, let's hear that one more time, and then we're going to go into some history. Watch this. Is that if you go to the average Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, etc., and ask them about being part of the 12 tribes, they will tell you they have no idea what you're talking about. None. Okay. He says, if you go up to the average Israelite or so-called black and Hispanic person and say, hey, you guys are Israelites, they're going to have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Well, let's just see. This is us teaching in Atlanta a few years ago, and a Native American chief came to our camp, and look what he said. Because 10,000 years ago, they found an ancient rock from my tribe, okay? And it was very prehistoric. It was about 10,000 years old. And the language on there is the same language as the Hebrew language, yeah. right? But also what's interesting about this rock is that the story is the story of the Jewish high holidays. So you can watch this video for yourself. This it says a Native American chief acknowledges Israelite identity. Here's a brother, a chief of a tribe in Massachusetts, and they identify and knows. He identifies and knows that we are the Israelites. So I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Let's keep going, though. Let's go to some more artifacts or to some more history. You have something called the Nazario Collection. The Nazario Collection, also known as uh, Agüe Banyas Libraries, are a cache of carved stones that originated in uh, Guyanilla, Puerto Rico. And look at this. It says, and you can look into this yourself. Nazario will combine his research with his religious background, leading to the hypothesis that there are, might be some connection between them, the indigenous people of Puerto Rico, and the 10 lost tribes. They found all kind of Hebrew artifacts here, there in Puerto Rico. Oops, I accidentally went there. Um, now watch this. You have also something called the Los Lunas Stone. The Los Lunas Stone in New Mexico is the Ten Commandments written in ancient Hebrew in order. Just because they're the average one of our people may not be familiar with this does not mean that the information is false. You have also something called the At Creek Stone. I mean, we got to go into that. Um, there was one, there was a few more points that I really wanted to own in on, right? Um, matter of fact, here we go. Now watch this. Watch this right here. Here is a book called A Star in the West. Let's read a little bit of this book called A Star in the West. Um, let's start right here. This is A Star in the West, page 111. Let's read this. It says, Our southern Indians have also a tradition among them, which they firmly believe, that of old time their ancestors lived beyond a great river, hmm. that nine parts of their nation out of ten passed over the river. Hmm. Sounds a whole lot like Second Ezra chapter 13, verse 40. Those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoner in the time of Salmanasa, our king of Assyria. But they took this counsel among themselves to leave the multitude of the heathen, and they journeyed over the Euphrates River, the ten tribes. Interesting. It says uh, that they had a king when they lived far to the west who left two sons. Sounds like Jeroboam. That one of them with a number of his people traveled a great way for many years till they came to the Delaware River and settled there. 
that some years ago, the king of the country from which they had immigrated sent a party in search of them. This was at the time the French were in possession of the country on the river Algony, right? Now, watch this. It is said among their uh, among their principal or beloved men, I mean, their, their chief men, their top men, their, their leaders, that they have it handed down from their ancestors, this oral tradition, that the book which the white people have, the Bible, the Torah, the Tanakh, what the, that the white people have was once theirs, that while they had it, they prospered exceedingly, but that the white people bought it of them and learnt many things from it. While the Indians lost their credit, offended the great spirit and suffered exceedingly from the neighboring nations, that the great spirit took pity on them and directed them to the country. I mean, good Lord. What else could this be talking about, you guys? Let's just see. Let's take a look in a book called 2nd Ezra 13th chapter. And then we can read this in concurrent with uh, Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. It says that their creator took pity on them and brought them to the Western Hemisphere. 2nd Ezra 13 and 40. Those are the 10 tribes. Then they say the 10 tribes which are carried away prisoners out of their own lands, Israel, in the time of Hosea the king. So that would have been the king, Hosea the king whom Salmanassar, the king of Assyria, led away captive. And he carried them over the waters. He said they lived beyond a river. And so they came they into another land. And they took this counsel among themselves, that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt, that they might there keep their statues, which they never kept in their own land. Hmm. That they were all right when they were following the book and that God had mercy on them and then sent them to that land. But while they did not follow the book, bad things happened to them. Well, that sounds a whole lot like Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So there would be curses that would take place. One of them would be that we would have a wife and another man would lie with her, that we would build a house and not dwell therein. Didn't that happen during slavery? The slave master came in, and if you wanted to lay with your wife, there was nothing you could do about it. You build their houses. You didn't live in those houses. You planted a vineyard. You picked cotton, but you didn't do it for you. You did it for them. Your ox should be slain before your eyes. Your, your animals should be killed in front of you. Wasn't there at one point 30 million buffalo in the plains region of the United States? And at one point, there was as low as 541 of them. It says, thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep, your cattle, your, your flock shall be given unto thy enemies, and you can't rescue them. Your sons and your daughters shall be given unto another people. Didn't they enslave so-called black and Hispanic people? It says, and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thy hands. The fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which you know not eat up. Didn't that not happen to us? Let's continue in reading. There's more in that book. Watch. It says, they also say that their forefathers, here we are. I'm oh, sorry, watch this. They on their way, that on their way, they came to a great river, which they could not pass. When God dried up the waters and they passed over, they also say that their forefathers, it says they passed over. Doesn't that say in 2nd Ezra chapter 13? Let's go back to that. 2nd Ezra chapter 13. Watch this. I'm not gonna watch this. Verse 44. For the most high then showed signs for them and held still the flood till they were passed over. It's the exact same thing that we just saw in 2nd Exodus 13. Let's go back to it. That uh they also say that their forefathers were possessed of an extra uh, extraordinary divine spirit. Isn't the father God is a spirit? They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. By which they foretold, foretold future events, prophecy, and controlled the common course of nature. And this they transmitted to their offspring uh, on condition of their obeying the sacred laws. Meaning we would be on top of the common course of nature, of the world, if we would obey the sacred laws. Isn't that exactly what Deuteronomy 28 says? Deuteronomy, this is a, a book called A Star in the West. 
Isn't that exactly what it says? Watch this right here. Let's go back to uh, Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, 1. And it shall come to pass, if you hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord will set thee high on, above all nations of the earth. Everything's going to be blessed. Our cattle will be blessed. The whole course of the world we will control if we keep the commandments. How the hell do they know about this if they're not the Israelites? But he said, again, if you ask the average Mexican and you ask the average Puerto Rican, if they're the Israelites, they're going to say they don't know what you're talking about. That has no relevance to whether or not they are, in fact, the Israelites, because the evidence is there. Let's continue on. Uh, it says that they did by these means bring down showers of plenty on the beloved people, but that this power for a long time past had entirely ceased. Why? Because we weren't keeping the commandments. It says uh, the the uh, the reverend gentleman mentioned in the introduction who had taken so much pains in the year 1764 or five to travel far westward to find Indians or Native Americans who had never seen a white man informed the writer of these memoirs that far to the northwest of the Ohio, he attended a party of Indians to a treaty. Let's see. Watch this. Let's get to another one. The Indian informed the Indian informed him that one of their most ancient traditions was that a great while ago, a long time ago, a while before 1764, they had a uh, they had a common father. They had a common father who lived towards the rising of the sun and governed the whole world. Who would that be? That all the white people's heads were under his feet. That he had 12 sons by whom he administered his government. And that his authority was derived from the great spirit. Who the F else could this be talking about, everybody? Let's get some bombs in the chat. This is some history from the tribe of Gad, man. So-called Native Americans. If you ask the average Mexican, you ask the average Dominican and Puerto Rican if they're Israelites, they're going to say they don't know what you're talking about. Not these ones. They're going to say that one of their greatest traditions is that they have a forefather who had 12 sons who was given power and authority from God. <laughs> and that if their people would follow the laws of God, that they would be blessed and how would rule the common course of the world. And that because they have not followed those sacred laws, that now they've been allowed to be enslaved by Europeans. I mean, come on, man. Let's keep going. That his authority was derived from the great spirits by virtue of some special gift from him that the 12 sons behaved very bad and tyrannized over the people abusing their power to a great degree so as to offend the great spirit exceedingly so these 12 sons the 12 tribes we went against god by abusing our power and doing the wrong thing that he being thus angry with them suffered the white people to introduce spiritual liquors among them made them drunk, stole the special gift of the great spirit from them, and by this means usurped the power over them, and ever since the Indians' heads were under the white people's feet. Is this not what the Bible says? Is this not exactly what the Bible says? Let's get it right here. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47. Watch this. So because we broke God's laws, let's start at verse 15. So what happened is if we did not hearken unto the voice of the Lord our God to keep his commandments, that all these curses shall come upon us and overtake us. What's one of these curses? Verse 47. Because we didn't serve God with the joyfulness of mind and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore shall thou serve thy enemies. The exact same thing what that book just said, what our ancestors said, is exactly what would happen to us. Therefore shalt thou serve thy enemies, which the Lord shall send against you, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon your neck until he's destroyed you. The nation shall be a, uh, the Lord shall bring a nation. Remember, because he said that God allowed this to happen. The Lord brought a nation against us from far, from the whole other side of the planet, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue or language you shall not understand. Is that not exactly what this book just said? Again, the book is called A Star in the West. But it says, but the Indians, but they, uh, but that they also had a tradition that the time would come when the Indians would regain the gift of the great spirit from the white people and with it, their ancient power, 
when the white people's heads would be again under Indians' feet. Oh, we there's so many verses that come to mind. Are you serious? I mean, come on, man. Look at this that we're reading right here. That's again it's a book called A Star in the West. That one day that we would get that power back. And once we get that power back, that all the nations will be under our feet. Isn't that exactly what like Ariella said? Genesis 27 says. Part of the blessing is this. Part of the blessing, part of the promises is this right here. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 29. Let people serve you and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Curse be everyone that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Isn't it? Doesn't it say in, to, to Christ, Psalm 110? Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now that's Christ. Christ's enemies will be his footstool, but we are going to be joint heirs with Christ. So we will be ruling with Christ. They're going to be under, they're going to be our footstool as well. How the hell do they know this? That's because they are the Israelites. Let's get another book. All right. I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from a book. I can't pull it up. There's some copyright problems, but the book is called Origins of the American Indian, right? I'm going to read this book called Origins of the American Indian. And let's it's this is page 88 of Origins of the American Indian. And let's see what this says, because, again, he said, well, if you tell a so-called Puerto Rican or Mexican or random black person that they're an Israelite, they're not going to know what the hell you're talking about. OK, so let's just show this real quick. All right. Here is this um, excerpt from Origins of the American Indian, and it's on page 88. All right. So let's read it. It says, Mexicans are originally from the 10 tribes captured by Salmanassar and from the family of Issachar, whom the Indians recognized as their special ancestor. That is from a book called Origins of the American Indian. I'll show you what the book is right here. This is Origins of the American Indian. Page 88. And this book right here. By Lee e., uh, Lee e. Huddlesfield or Huddleston. And that's page 88. And they say that the, the Native American people in that region, the Mexicans regarded Issachar as their ancestor like Gazah said his mother's an Issacharite see that our people understood this history right not just the northern kingdom though the southern kingdom did as well watch this and I'm, I'm gonna keep going and um and let this guy continue to make himself look like an absolute fool all right go to the the a member of the Seminole Indians and try to convince them that they're from the tribe of Reuben they will laugh at me. They will laugh you out of the building. Why? Because you're trying to make up an entire history. We're laughing at you, actually, because we actually have done some research. And that's why you keep pausing and uh, because you haven't done proper due diligence in doing some just an iota of research. If you did, you would know about these this, these books and this information. DJ A.K. Golson, when was this book written down? Which one? The first one was written down in the. Middle of the 18th century, I believe, or the 17th century. This is from an explorer who came over here and was communicating to uh, a lot of the indigenous peoples over here. All right, let's keep going. They know their history. Why didn't their great grandparents or their grandparents teach them um, Hebrew or that they're really part, they're really Jewish? Okay, well, we've already proven a few of the Northern Kingdom. Let's now prove some of the Southern Kingdom. So, um, let me pull this up real quick. Watch this. And so, brother and sister, what was Harriet Tubman's name before she changed her name to Harriet? And what significance does that have to us as Hebrews? Her, her name was, before she changed her name, after she uh, ran away, her name was Araminta Ross. And Araminta is a Hebrew, a Hebrew name. Uh, her family um, knew, knew that they were uh, from the Ashanti tribe, and uh, which is is now uh, part of Ghana. 
and that they were uh, Hebrew. They they did have Hebrew um, names before they were um, in slavery. Thank you so much. And as we read a little bit, you can find the Ashanti tribe actually in the book of the Old Testament. And we, we showed that in the book of Joshua. So you can see this video. These are uh, this is a brother and sister who are descendants of Harriet Tubman. And they make mention that their ancestor, Harriet Tubman, and her ancestors, which is also their ancestors, that they knew that they were Israelites and told their children that they were Israelites and told their children where they came from. So let's play what this guy said one more time. Their history. Why didn't their great grandparents or their grandparents teach them um, Hebrew or that they're really part, they're really Jewish? Uh, well, one, let's answer the second one first. Um, they were taught, we were taught that we were Israelites. Uh, why weren't we taught Hebrew? Well, there was enough Hebrew that was taught to us that the so-called Mexicans of the tribe of Issachar in New Mexico wrote the Ten Commandments written in Hebrew in order. Thou shall have no gods before me and then continue to read on down. They have all the Ten Commandments. Um, <laughs> so this guy has no idea what he's talking about. But let's let's just inter let's just introduce something as well. We were in slavery. They didn't allow us to read and write, let alone in our own language. What The reason why, just to directly answer your question with something simple that you might be able to understand, the reason why we don't speak Hebrew right now, so-called Black and Hispanic people, which if you go into certain parts of actually um, in Mexico and the language that they're uh, indigenous language, I can't remember, Nahua, I believe. Even when we look at the word Nahua, that is a Hebraic word. And when you look at the language of the Nahua, it's a Hebraic language. But we were forced to speak Spanish. We were sp forced to speak English and in, in, in Creole, in, which is a form of French, and Portuguese. We're forced to speak these things. We weren't allowed to speak our own language. Why weren't they taught Hebrew? Because we were picking cotton and then whipped if we spoke our own language. What are you talking about? What a stupid question. Why did they speak Hebrew? They didn't let us read or write. Why didn't they speak Hebrew? Nigga, what's wrong with you? Right. The Hebrew Israelites have to give them their story because white people stole it. And it's not based on science, but a vision that someone essentially claimed to have. Right. This is Apple White theorem all over again. Marshall Applewhite convinced a group of individuals that a spaceship was coming to pick them up. Right. And they're all descendants of aliens. Right. They just have to insert a. Somebody asked in the chat, DJ AK Gold said, When was a star in the West written down? Um, let me check it out. Uh, it was written. Let me pull it up. Um, let me see. Eighteen sixteen, I believe. So very early nineteenth century. Okay. Reason why their family knows nothing about it, and then the charismatic cult leader can essentially get away with it, right? Insert disease, famine, war, slavery, you know, theft, whatever you want to insert as a reason to why their tradition was essentially lost and you're coming to give it back to them and some people are gullible, gullible enough to believe it. It's not about being gullible enough to believe it. It's about logical deductions being made and then we didn't lose all of our history. That's a myth. We just read some of our history where our ancestors identified themselves as being Israelites. We can look at the cultures and practices of our ancestors and the tribes that we come from and see Hebrewisms in there. This guy has no idea what he's talking about. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any, any more. This is a 40 minute video. There's some things that he says that I can't play on YouTube. Uh, he talks about the event that starts with the H that took place in the 1940s. I think we all know what that is. I'm definitely not going to play that on this video. All right. So I find it problematic because they're essentially trying to rewrite history. Black Americans are the only ones claiming to be a part of, you know, these tribes. You don't hear Dominicans saying this. You don't hear Puerto Ricans saying this. You don't
Why is my screen doing that? Here is a Puerto Rican <laughs> saying that he's an Israelite. Here are a few more Puerto Ricans saying that they are Israelites. <laughs> what the? F what are you talking about? <laughs> All right. Uh, what about some Dominicans? Um, let me see. What's my brother's name? Watch this. Hold on. Hold on. Let me see this brother's name. Um, watch this. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me see if I can pull up this video. This guy's just talking, man. He's just. He's just chatting shit. Uh, or how do they say in a, in a <laughs> Rav, Rav and them just chatting shit, bro. That's what he's doing. Excuse my language, right? But um, where is this? What's this brother? Um, what's his brother name? This brother's camp. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's my brother's name, bro? I'm gonna get mad. What's his name? Here we go. Here we go. Here's my brother right here. Okay, hold on. Can I find? Do they got a YouTube channel? Perfect. What's their name? Watch this. Okay. All praise the most high. Let me show you this so I get this. Um, Nazarenos. Uh, Israel Nazarene. Is this what I'm looking for? No, that's not it. Yeah. Where are these brothers at? If I can't find it, but there's some brothers in the DR that we, that uh you know some cool brothers in the, in the DR that teach that we're the Israelites. I can't find it anyway. You guys get the point. The point's proven. All right. Um, let's get back to a little bit more about what this guy said, and then we're gonna be done with. He said Black Americans are the only ones. To what an outright lie. Okay. One who produces the tribe is famine. Simply not the case. Actually lost, and you're coming to give back to them. And some people are gullible, gullible enough to believe it. Okay. So I find it problematic because they're essentially trying to rewrite history. Black Americans are the only ones claiming to be a part of, you know, these tribes. You don't hear Dominicans saying this. You don't hear Puerto Ricans saying this. You don't hear Mexicans saying this. Seminole Indians, you don't hear them saying this. Why don't they know? I mean, as we've already illustrated, that's a lie. So this maybe I'll do a part two on this because there's some more information I'd like to, to get into. But I saw this video and I just said, oh, my God. I, I cannot believe what this dude is saying. We've already shown a book called A Star in the West, where people identify that as the Israelites. Just as two just came off the top of my head, A Star in the West and the Origins of the American Indian. There's a whole lot more. Um, you know, with that, um, let's see. Is there anybody in the chat that wants to smoke? I know there was somebody earlier that said that I'm not an Israelite. We can set that up for another time, matter of fact. Um, but I hope that was edifying. I hope y'all learned something, man. I really appreciate the support that y'all been giving, man. And I'm not, again, I'm not just talking about, you know, financially, you know, uh, brothers, definitely. I see y'all helping with, with the super chats and I definitely appreciate it, but you don't even have to do that. Just, you know, if you like and share the video, just get this information out there. It really helps uh, because it helps all of us. I'm sick of having to wake up and work 17 hour, 12 hour, 13 hour shifts as all of us, I'm sure are sick of going to work every day. And so the more that this message gets spread, the more of us that wake up, the sooner that we get the hell out of here and we don't have to be under our pressure no more. So just make sure y'all like and share the video. And um, I definitely hope that y'all learn something from it. I hope, you know, again, that y'all learn something from it. I want to give all praises to the Heavenly Father, whose true name in Hebrew is Yahweh in the name of his only begotten son, who most people call Jesus, but his real name is Yahweh Shai. This is your brother Saad signing out. Shalom.